Hey friends, today's video is brought to you by Raycon. Raycon delivers premium sound quality at the perfect price, no matter what you're looking for. Whether it's their everyday earbuds, low latency gaming headphones, or their amazing Bluetooth speakers, Raycon's got you covered. The everyday earbuds come with three customizable sound profiles, easy to use tap functions, awareness and noise isolation modes, as well as superb sound quality. And on top of that, there are three different sizes of gel tips, each giving the user the perfect fit, and they're totally water and sweat resistant. Now recently I discovered a super handy Raycon feature that my old pair of earbuds didn't have, and that's the ability to reject incoming calls. With my old pair, every time I got a call while out on a bike ride or whatever it might be, I'd have to either stop and pull my phone out or wait for the person to hang up. But with the everyday earbuds, one little tap and I can send the call to voicemail, and then I'll be back to listening to my playlist in no time. So, if you're ready to buy something small that has a big impact on your quality of life, just click on the link in the description below, or go to buyraycon.com slash letsreadyt to get 15% off your purchase. They'll send you one pair of Raycon everyday wireless earbuds, five pairs of silicon gel tips, and one charging kit, all for less than half the price of competing brands. Just a reminder that using my code really helps support the channel, so if you're in the market for a new pair of earbuds, head over to buyraycon.com slash letsreadyt for that sweet 15% off. Back about 20 years ago, I was a young boy scout. Like me, my father had been a scout and made it all the way to Eagle, and I intended to follow in his footsteps. My scout master, a personal friend of my dad, by the way, encouraged everyone in the troop to do as much volunteer work as possible, and this is what led me down the path of search and rescue. We had little need for a permanent team. Disappearances weren't very common, and the county lacked the resources to maintain a group even if there were. My first experience with the practice was when a male senior citizen was reported missing by his daughter. It took the deputies almost a whole day to discover his car on an abandoned logging road. The size of the surrounding forest was far too much for them to search on their own. Our scout leader was contacted for help and we answered. I enjoyed it immensely. As for me, it was really just similar to a treasure hunt, but one I took very seriously. I'm happy to say that the old gentleman was discovered safe and sound the following day. He created a campsite after he realized that he was lost and had been there ever since, and even in his confused state, his hunter instincts kicked in and kept him safe. My reason for posting today and sharing this with Let's Read is to share my version of the biggest search myself and my fellow scouts took place in. It was the summer of 2002, and I was dreading the imminent approach of another school year. I was about to be a senior. With it came all the responsibilities I feared. Biggest among them was my choice of college. The truth was, I was already losing any interest in school or anything associated really with it. I felt hopelessly lost. Everything I'd once enjoyed, even scouting, just seemed stupid and childish. I wanted to leave the scouts for almost a year by this point, but I feared how my dad would react. He had pinned his hopes on me, and it was not an ideal position to be in. In the midst of all this inner turmoil, I got a call to report in at my scout leader's house. I reluctantly drove over and was told that we had been called out to assist on another search operation. It was actually a very welcome distraction. Unlike most other things in my life, the love of the hunt, the search, was alive and well inside of me. Taking part in something so important gave me a sense of purpose nothing else had for a long while. We all loaded into the van and made our way to the national park. Very little was achieved that first day. Sundown arrived within a few hours of our arrival. Camp was set near to where the missing man had camped out the day prior. And just as the sun broke over the trees the following morning, we awoke and prepared for that day's search. The search yielded far more this day. Several people we spoke to had seen the man and one woman had even spoken to him briefly. She said that he showed no signs of distress and was in quote-unquote high spirits. Despite all the information that we'd accumulated, the poor guy remained missing. Upon rising the third day, a sense of urgency pulsed through the group. The odds of finding our quarry alive were dwindling with each day. Without water, he may get by three days if he was lucky. 
I briefly entertained the possibility that he'd gone out there to end his life, but the woman's account gave me hope. Sometime after midday, our group came to a cave complex. It wasn't really much more than a short series of small tunnels you could crawl through. The six of us split into teams of two and worked our way in and out of each cave. My friend and I were nearing the end of the second cave and noticed that there had been a collapse. At first, we didn't see anything besides rock and dirt, but my friend caught sight of something out of place and we got closer to investigate. Just as we began moving rocks aside, a leg moved. It wasn't long before the other scouts joined us in the cave. A few ran back to find help as we continued digging the man out. There were so many rocks on top of him, I was shocked that he'd survived at all, let alone almost three days more. In less than ten minutes, we had him unburied enough to see his face. He managed to open his eyes, although very weakly. One of the adults arrived and offered him a canteen of water. He snatched it out of the volunteer's hand and gulped it ferociously. The crazed look in his eyes terrified me. I'd never encountered that level of madness in my life and I hope I never do again. The paramedics arrived and rushed him off, and I wouldn't see him again for several months. I was almost halfway finished with my senior year when I got a message from my ex-scoutmaster. I'd finally summed up the courage to tell my dad that I wanted to quit scouts, and he took it far better than I expected. There was no yelling or anything. Although he was clearly disappointed, he didn't try to make me feel guilty. I called my ex-scoutmaster back and he said that he had a surprise for me but wouldn't say what it was. I drove over to his house and he introduced me to a familiar face. It was the man that we discovered in the cave. And it turned out that he was a newly arrived German immigrant. That weekend he had been camping and exploring the park near his new home. He wanted to thank me for saving him and I didn't know how to react. I could only say thanks and shake his hand and we spoke for about an hour and he thanked me once more before leaving. He gave me a big hug and then left. And it's a day I'll never forget, and I'm so happy to have spoken to him in better circumstances, and he and I stay in contact to this day over email. Each year around Christmas, I'll even get a Christmas card with his picture of his family on it, and since that day we met, he'd gone on to marry and have at least five children. Even if I never achieve another thing, I can proudly say that I saved a man's life. At the age of 18, I met the man who would change my life forever, and this story is about him. Caleb West was born in 1955 in a remote part of Montana. From a very early age, he spent his time in the nearby woods and mountains. He was a naturalist, skilled marksman and hunter, all useful skills to assist his family to get through the harsh Montana winters. At around 14, Caleb took up rock climbing, and just by chance, he ran into a group of older boys while on a camping trip. The group, all from outside the county, were climbing a local peak. They were fascinated with Caleb's natural agility and strength and asked the young man to join them. As he did with most things, Caleb took to the sport like a duck to water. Quickly, he surpassed all of his teachers and became one of the best young climbers in the state. Rather than moving away from college, Caleb remained near home, taking jobs as a ranch hand and hunting guide. His work kept him busy, but he always found time to climb. Many of the older climbers that he'd grown up with now had families and had little time for such trivial activities. Perhaps from a lack of climbing partners, he found himself drawn to the realm of search and rescue. Once or twice, he'd come across those men in the mountains as they searched for lost hunters and hikers, but doing it for a living never crossed his mind. It took an invitation from an old climbing friend to get him interested. Constantly short of experienced climbers, the group sometimes found themselves at a great disadvantage. Caleb would be the perfect man for the job, you see. His wood smarts and tracking skills, along with his natural adeptness at reaching hard to get to places, set him above and beyond many in the group. He excelled at the work, quickly making a name for himself among the wider community. For the next 20 years or so, Caleb worked his way up through the ranks, saving hundreds of lost and stranded people in the process. It was 1997 when our paths would first cross. Caleb was teaching beginner rock climbing classes at the gym I attended. We struck up a conversation and before I knew it, I was his new climbing partner. Those years taught me so much about climbing and working as a team. 
They were not without excitement either. We had been climbing together for over three years when I made a near fatal misstep that almost took myself and Caleb a thousand feet to our deaths. Being the seasoned professional that he was, Caleb acted quickly, arresting our descent before it was too late. After that, he had my undying loyalty and respect. I did go off to college, but my heart was always in the mountains. As soon as I flunked out, I went straight to Caleb to ask for a job. He was reluctant at first, believing that I was better off in school. He spoke to my parents, and they gave their blessing. And from there on, I worked side by side with him for the next seven years. I learned every aspect that I could. Tracking, first aid, and even search planning were among the lessons. Caleb was a great teacher, but even as I near 50, I still have volumes to learn. And by 2008, the old man had began stepping back a bit, allowing the younger among us to get more experience. We were looking for a stranded climber when the worst happened. Caleb was up in the chopper leading the search when a freak crosswind blew it too close to the mountain. The chopper dropped like a rock from the sky and crashed into the valley below. Unfortunately, no one survived. It remains the biggest tragedy of my life. Caleb had become more like a second father to me and losing him was a nightmare. And we had no time to mourn, though. There was still a man lost out in the mountain. Not finding him would mean Caleb sacrificed his life for nothing. He would be found the following day, and only then were we free to mourn the loss of our brother. I would stay with our team until 2015 when I decided to find a safer place of employment. And perhaps by chance, or maybe by destiny, I would discover my wife was expecting our second child the same week as the accident. It was a very bittersweet event. Out of nowhere, my wife suggested that we name our new son after Caleb. I was hesitant at first, thinking that it may serve as a terrible reminder of that dark day, but all these years on, I'm glad that I agreed. Every time I look upon my wonderful boy, not only do I see the ultimate result of our love, I'm reminded of the man who made me who I am. A great friend and teacher, but most important of all, a hero to the many he rescued in their darkest moments, and may his name live on forever. I began volunteering in search and rescue during college. After school ended, I joined on as a part-time employee and stayed for a year until I got a full-time job. I'd spent the majority of my life in those mountains. My dad had been taking us there since I was five, and I spent more time there when I began learning to rock climb at 13. It wasn't long before I began regretting my decision. I lasted almost a year at my new place, until I could fight the call of the mountains no longer. I contacted my old boss and he agreed to take me back as a full-time employee. It would be a sizable decrease in pay, but I was willing to take the hit. That would be where I would stay for 10 years until my first son was born and I was forced to take a higher paying job in California. My memory isn't quite what it used to be, and therefore I figured that I better tell my most important story before it slips away forever. The story actually began a few months after I returned and would go unresolved for almost 15 years. It started with a report of a female hiker that had gone missing. Before setting off on her journey, she checked in with the rangers at the nearby station. They contacted us after she never returned. Within a few hours, we were all together, briefed and on the trail in search for her. Now the search would go on for another two days until weather set in and stopped it. The weather kept us off the mountain for almost a week, and when we were finally able to return, the search had become more of a retrieval operation. I'm sad to say, even after almost a month of searching, we never found a single sign of her. Not a track, a piece of clothing, nothing. Little did we know at the time, this search would be one of many related searches for years to come. After that search, we would go on to have three or four more successful ones. Then... On a cold, foggy fall evening, we received a call of a missing couple. They had been registered to camp for a week, but after about four days were reported missing. Upon arriving at their camp, there were signs that someone had rummaged through their tent. Many of their things had been destroyed and possibly even stolen. It appeared to be foul play, and luckily some members of the sheriff's department had been training with us at the time. They were able to ensure that nothing was messed up during that search or 
anything we did would hinder the investigation or eventual trial. Just before dark on the second day, we discovered the couple. Both had been almost certainly murdered. The female appeared to also have been violated, it seemed, and the deputies took over the scene from there, so that's the extent of what I know about that case. Now once the fall gave way to winter, things were relatively quiet until spring came along. A few climbers came up missing, but were quickly found safely. And when the first spring thaw came along, an unexpected surprise was uncovered. A group of men were out maintaining the trails as they did every year and came across a body of a young female. The situation was quite confusing as we had no reports of missing women in the park or in the surrounding area. As far as I know, that poor woman remains unidentified to this day. We had little time to regroup when another young woman came up missing. She had been camping with a group of friends and became separated from them at some point. We had been called in late in the day, so I had little time to search. By midday, the next day, we came across her clothing neatly folded on a ledge. More than 50 feet below lay the Columbia River where she was assumed to have plunged to her death. Without any evidence to the contrary, her disappearance had been ruled that she had taken her own life, and that was the end of it. Or it would be until what came next. The next major search we undertook would stir up the suspicion that there may be a serial killer at work in that area. As was customary, when a couple did not check in with the ranger on their way out, we were contacted to begin the search. Naturally, we started at the camping spot. Strangely, there was no sign of their camping equipment anywhere. Considering there was a possibility that they'd moved on to another spot, we moved on further up the trail to look for a new campsite. Two days passed and there was still no sign of them or their equipment. The third day would be when the body of the male was found wedged in a small cave. His body showed signs of foul play very similar to the bodies of other homicide victims we discovered in the last few years. Law enforcement would start to put things together. It was all they really had at this point, but it was something at least. Once the pattern was discovered, the local officials did everything they could to keep it quiet. They feared that this would destroy the tourism industry in which the area relied so much on. Even when it did make it out to the press, it was denied and labeled a conspiracy theory. Supposedly, most, if not all of the deaths, could be assumed to be animal attacks. Few believed it, but it remained the official story until the killers were caught nearly two decades later. The press did have the positive effect of ending the disappearances. We all held our breath, dreading the next missing female or couple case to occur, but... After a year, it looked like a spree had come to an end. After my time in search and rescue ended, I moved on with my life for the most part. From time to time, I would contact friends back home and catch up. The serial killings and disappearances never came up. Out of the blue, though, I got an email from one of those old friends. By now, over 15 years had passed since the crimes ended. I clicked the link and what came up made my jaw drop. All these years later, two men had been arrested in connection with the crimes. A piece of clothing had been retested for DNA, and two separate samples were found. These samples were run through a database, and the pair were a match. Both were doing prison time for assaulting women at the time. And further down, the article claimed that one of the men cut a deal and confessed to his and the other man's involvement in the murders. Although the article didn't go into specifics, it was said that Everything the man had said matched the evidence. The man gave the authorities the locations of the bodies of the victims that were not found up to that time. Unfortunately, not all of the bodies could be recovered. It had just been so long. It is assumed animals drug off some of the remains or weather washed them away. There was one curveball, however. The female, who was at first thought to have taken her own life, was then included in the murders, and it was not mentioned in the confession. There would be several more interrogations over the years, but neither man would ever admit to knowing anything about her death. As things stand now, it really does look like she took her life, even if her family and friends refused to accept it. Once the men were caught, the story was essentially forgotten. There were no trials. The men were given multiple life sentences, and the story slipped back into the past. Other than the families of the victims, my memories and those of my friends in the search team are all that made the story real. And now that I'm old and retired and many of those guys from back then are actually long dead, it seemed that the kind and wise thing to do would to pass these stories on to you. 
Now, people say the internet is forever, and I hope that's true. I'll be able to rest easier knowing those innocent victims' memories will live on way far longer than any of them could have ever imagined. They deserve at least as much as that, don't you think? I can't recall a time before the hills came into my life. You see, not long after I began to walk, my parents had me alongside them as they hiked the forests and peaks of the Rockies. At least a week every year was spent camping out. Day-long walks to out-of-the-way spots were only briefly interrupted by short fishing trips along the path. I didn't fall in love with angling as my dad did, but hiking and climbing was something that I fell into head first. When my dad grew too old to accompany me to the mountains, I sought out others to join me. I've had all manner of climbing partners. Some became great friends while others stayed in my life only briefly, and over the years I climbed any rock wall, hill, or snowy peak that I could get to, and more than once I believed that I was just seconds from death. I obviously survived, but after one particularly bad day on Denali in which I would lose all my toes on one foot and a finger on one hand, I would put the big peaks behind me. This would by no means keep me from the mountains altogether. Just as recently as a month ago, I took a scenic scramble on a rocky hill near me. For the most part, my trips are uneventful these days, but there was one incident about a decade ago that shook my confidence a bit. I was around 32 and in great health. Earlier that day, I had taken my regular five-mile bike ride and was preparing to take a little hike into the mountains. I arrived just after noon, leaving my forerunner in the parking lot and headed up my favorite trail. It was a sunny and warm day if I remember correctly. No bad weather comes to mind at that moment. I was making great time and arrived at my rest point in about two hours. A few other hikers were also there and joined me for lunch, after which I made my way for my car. I was about 20 minutes into my return trip when I ran into a new group of hikers. They appeared very panicked. They ran up to me upon seeing me and inquired if I'd come across a lone female on the trail. I told them I had not. Now at this time they told me that they had lost one of the members of their team as they headed for the top, and I naturally offered to help them in their search and they accepted. The rest of the afternoon was spent searching every possible area that we could think of. Many areas were searched multiple times, and by now the search and rescue team had joined in and taken charge of the operation. About an hour prior to sundown, I was assigned to research a small area along the banks of the creek. My group consisted of myself and a few members of the search and rescue team. It was thought that the climber could not have fallen into the water because of the trees lining the bank. The problem with this was that there was a large open section where the lady could have gone into the water and been washed downstream. I proposed my idea and asked one of our group to join me as I waited downstream until dark. We waded in and began following the current. As we walked, each one of us closely scanned our side of the bank for any signs of our target. Roughly 50 feet down the creek, my partner called out to me. He had seen a patch of bright blue among a tangle of brush on his side of the water. I waited over to help him dig through the mass of limbs and grass. It wasn't long before we came face to face with our climber. She was floating face up. My teammate checked her pulse, probably expecting not to find one, but to his delight, a faint one was detected. He stayed with the victim as I returned to the shore to call to the rest of the team. I feared that she would slip away in the little amount of time that it took for them to show up, but fortunately she did not. The medics followed me back to the victim where they strapped her to a backboard and rushed her off. It was a rewarding end to an exhausting day, but the poor climber had much further to go before she was out of the woods. My purpose was fulfilled there and I returned home. I was hopeful, but I was really exhausted and I slept through until the next afternoon. It would probably be several days until any news would be released. I did my best to carry on with my life until then. Five days after she was found, a member of her group called to let me know that the climber was stable and she wanted to see me in person to thank me. I went to the hospital later that day to visit. As she said, she thanked me for assisting in the search. I'll admit that I was out of my element. I'm actually a very shy and humble man. I said thank you and moved the subject on to something other than myself. And in time, she recalled exactly what had happened on the mountain that day. She was feeling short of breath and was resting alongside the creek. 
Suddenly, a sharp pain stabbed her in the chest. It was so bad that she lost consciousness, and that was the last thing that she remembered until she woke up in the hospital the next morning. It was certainly a bit of a shock to hear of a 35-year-old woman having a heart attack, but I suppose none of us are as healthy as we think. Her near-death experience changed my life greatly, just as my own had, and since then, I've made sure to keep up with my doctor and get scans every few years. Despite what we may believe, everything in our younger years, none of us are really bulletproof. I didn't survive below zero temperatures on top of a mountain and lose digits just to drop dead at the supermarket. So please, everybody take care of yourselves. Life is far too precious of a thing to take for granted. Growing up, my neighborhood was located off by itself on the edge of town. Not many people from the outside even really knew about us. The development had been built on an old farmland and much of the remaining and undeveloped land, which there was a lot of, was forested. Being kids with nothing better to do, we spent most of our days in those woods. There had been a makeshift clubhouse out there for as long as I could remember, but we spent one summer completely rebuilding and improving it. The new clubhouse became our home away from home, and many of us came from abusive families, and the clubhouse gave us a sort of refuge from the chaos. One of us spent a whole summer there. His parents' divorce had become so adversarial that his home environment was just unbearable to him, and to tell you the truth, I don't think they even noticed that he was gone. The rest of us came and went all hours of the day and night, and it served especially useful for the days that we skipped school. The clubhouse was just a meeting point for us all, and the warmer times of the year a lot of time was spent fishing and swimming in the nearby creek, and this is where I first learned to swim. We had a rope swing tied high up in a tree, but the creek was rarely deep enough to use it. When we weren't playing in the creek, we explored further into the woods. On one of our little adventures, we discovered a homeless camp. It sat about a quarter mile from the clubhouse on the opposite side of the creek. We were too scared to get too close, and we'd set up on the hill above the camp and watch the bums drink and sometimes fight each other. And this kept us entertained for hours on end. But as the years passed, we grew bolder and in some ways, more cruel. I believe this behavior is what led to one of our people actually suffering an unknown but certainly terrible fate. For the first year we kept our distance, the homeless in the camp had no clue that we were there as far as I know. I'm not sure how they initially discovered that we were watching, but boy oh boy, when they did, it would stir up a hornet's nest. We were posted up on the bluff one night as usual, and one of the homeless began hurling curses and insults our way. I had butterflies in my stomach. I think I was only 10 or 11 at the time, and any time an adult yelled at me, I got scared. A few of the guys hurled insults back, but nothing major. Now they knew that we were watching, the fun kind of went out of it. Had the drunks left us alone, we probably would have done the same. Unfortunately for everyone involved, that wouldn't happen, and instead, the whole situation just got kind of out of hand. It must have been done when all of us were in school or occupied elsewhere. A few of us arrived at the clubhouse to see it had been vandalized. The roof had been pulled down and a note was spray-painted on the wall that read, Go home, you little brats. Kind of funny, but any fear I may have had now disappeared as I was actually pretty angry. They had crossed the line, and we weren't about to let it go. The next day, four of us skipped school and got some payback. Usually during the daytime, the bums weren't around. Not only did we tear down all their shelters, we burned anything that was flammable, including tents and sleeping bags. We walked away confident that they would get the hint and call a truce, and for a while it seemed to have worked. The revenge attack that we expected never came, and we went back to entertaining ourselves in other ways. However, as time passed, a few of us became curious and returned to the bluff. A bad idea in retrospect. I'm not sure who rekindled the feud, but the insults soon began being exchanged once more. I'm also not sure who escalated it to stone throwing, but we gave just as good as we got. Night after night, rocks filled the air. Few of us were ever hit, and I can't say if any of them were, but... It did nothing to curtail the animosity. I'm sure you can see where this is going. On a day that we were away, some homeless returned to the clubhouse and completely leveled the place. It was so erased that we thought the landowner had done it. Not a shred of metal or piece of wood remained. 
It wasn't until one of the homeless gloated across no man's land about their handiwork and that we knew that they were the culprits. When we invaded their camp to get revenge, we realized that much of their shelters were made from our sheet metal, the metal that had been our clubhouse, and this set us off. Rather than burn it down as we had planned, we took a new path. While a few of the guys carried the metal to a new location, the rest urinated on every absorbent surface in sight. One guy took things even further by taking a dump on a table. The war had become a case of tit for tat, nothing more than petty childish pranks, but the day finally came when the adults had enough. The children were about to get a lesson on how terrible war can truly be. We were all about the same age. The oldest among us was 14 and served as a big brother to the rest. Mike was 12. He lived the street over from me and his home life was one of the more normal until his father died in a bike accident. His mom was forced to work around the clock to keep their house. This left him alone a lot of the time. He'd stay with one of us when possible, but when it wasn't, he'd spend the night at the clubhouse. We'd just rebuild it in a new location much deeper in the woods and away from the homeless camp. The last night Mike slept out there, he'd ask some of us to join him, but none of us could. And this remains my biggest regret. Truthfully, I probably could have snuck out my window and spent at least a few hours with him, but I didn't feel like it that night. None of us knew that that would be the last time that we'd ever see him. It was a Sunday and several of us met up to do some final touches on the new club. Mike had not come up in the conversation and none of us had spoken to him that day. I assumed, like everyone else, that he'd be at the clubhouse when we got there. When he wasn't, there wasn't any concern. He was most likely at home or out with his mom, we thought. We went about our work. After we finished, we were all headed home. I stopped at Mike's on my way only to discover that he wasn't there. His mom had just returned from work and assumed that he was with us. Although odd, I ignored this and returned home and went to bed. I would awake the next day to a chaotic mess of fear and panic. Mike's mom grabbed me by the shoulders and begged me to tell her where Mike had gone, and I was so groggy and confused. After I had some time to clear out the cobwebs, I asked her what was happening. She said Mike had never come home the night before. She'd called everyone, but... Nobody had seen or spoken to him since the night prior. Maybe she thought that we were playing a joke on her or something. Adults aren't in the habit of telling kids all their thoughts, and I can only guess what she was thinking. Despite the situation, we were sent to school as usual. There was no lack of theories about what had happened. Most were like alien abduction and other equally stupid ideas. Our group were the only ones who knew about the war with the homeless and all the crazy stuff that had gone on during it. One by one, each of us were pulled out of class to be questioned. Nobody said anything. In our minds, if it came out, everything we had built would be ruined and our domain spoiled. It would prove to be a waste of time anyways. One of the parents told the cops about all the time that we spent in the woods, and by the next morning it had all been discovered. The clubhouse, the homeless camp, everything. The cops called in a local search and rescue team to assist them. Some of the residents joined in. Just the idea of all these adults crawling all over the woods was heartbreaking. No matter what came of this, our sanctuary would never be the same. When the news arrived that the homeless camp had been found, we were sure that it was all over for us. To our amazement, the homeless kept their mouths shut too. I can only guess that they were thinking the same as us. They loved the woods as much as we did. Maybe we had more in common than we ever knew, I can't really say. And without any real suspects or motives, the authorities could do nothing but continue their search. By the time the operation was finally called off, I think the search and rescue team had combed through every inch of those woods three times over. Mike's body would never be found, nor would anyone ever be charged with his disappearance. I still like to believe that Mike ran away and found a loving family to take him in. We both fantasized about it more than once. Maybe he's living in a foreign land under a different name, raising his own family. I know it's all just a childish delusion made up to cope with the loss of a cherished friend. Maybe so, but it's better than thinking of the more likely outcome. A foolish but kind child spending his final moments terrified before being slain by a bunch of psychotic homeless men, or possibly an unknown and faceless serial child killer. Even if he was the victim of a wild animal or fell into a narrow cave only to succumb to exposure or dehydration, None of these are a scenario I have any interest in thinking about. 
I may be smart enough to know nothing good has come from his disappearance, but I'll stay a little longer in my dream world. It's a far happier place. After the whole thing blew over, we tried to build the clubhouse and make the woods ours again, but it just wasn't to be. Something just felt different. Our age probably played a big part of it. Most of us were in high school now. Our priorities were shifting towards sports and girls. That sense of imagination and youthful innocence had faded, and most of all, the biggest part of our family had left us without being able to say goodbye. My last year before college, I would still venture down to those woods on occasion to be alone with my thoughts. That empty, strange feeling was still there, but now, a new force was present. Strangely familiar and comforting, yet melancholy and lonesome is all I can really describe it as. We would walk together, among the trees, sometimes in silence, sometimes in discussion, just as Mike and I used to. In those moments, it was as if nothing had changed, as if Mike was still there with me. And looking back, I think he may have been. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. 2018 was probably the year everything began to really fall apart. Earlier in the year, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Dad had already passed just five years before from a heart attack, and losing her would surely be too much to bear. I became determined to keep my mom alive as long as possible. Her treatment had been going well, and she had outlived her initial prognosis. Both of us were very optimistic of her future. Then, the big pandemic hit, and she was one of the first to be infected in town. She fought so hard, but in the end, it was too much for her immune system, and she lost that battle. Because of the rules at the time, I was unable to hold a funeral. Of all the indignities that we were forced to suffer during that period of time, that remains the worst for me. Not too long after mom passed, her sister, my aunt Penny, also died. The only person left in my family, the only person I could talk to, was now gone too. From then on, I fell into a deep pit of despair, drifting through my days just waiting for my turn to die. Another two years passed and my time never really came, so life had more or less gone back to normal, but I was still inconsolable. After some thought, I decided that I needed some form of closure. I contacted a few people and scheduled a simple graveside funeral for mom. Maybe if I had finally had the chance to say goodbye, I could begin to heal. Around 30 people showed up for the service. One of mom's old friends made a beautiful speech and several others came up and told stories of happier times. It turned out to be just what I needed. It was during a conversation with one of those old friends when she suggested that I take some time for myself, something akin to a getaway or vacation and it sounded like a good idea. For the better part of a week, I searched countless destinations. In the end, I chose a location an hour north of my home. For the sake of my own privacy, I'll leave out what that location was, and for the sake of the story, I will, however, say that it was a national park in the northwestern United States. The drive was peaceful and the park beautiful. I found a nice, quiet campsite away from the rest of the visitors and pitched my little tent there. I'd only used the tent once before, many years ago, so the setup took me some time. I was too tired to make a fire and fell asleep instead. I awoke just before sunrise the next morning ready to explore. I took to the trail with a light pack and my new camera. The morning went much faster than I'd expected. The lavish lunch that I had planned was reduced to a cup of tea and a sandwich. I reached my objective in about an hour and I remained there another hour taking pictures before beginning my return trip. Halfway through my trip, I came across a large open meadow. I stopped briefly to pick some wildflowers from my diary and then continued, and less than ten minutes later I stumbled upon my worst nightmare. You can guess it. The dreaded grizzly. You see, it all happened so quickly that I was unable to form an escape plan. The bear must have been bedded down or in the shadows which made seeing it earlier impossible. I was virtually face to face with it before I realized the danger. I think I probably surprised it as much as it had me. In the blink of an eye, the massive beast raised up two legs and roared aggressively. Instinct must have kicked in. I turned and ran despite knowing it was the wrong thing to do. 
I headed for the nearest cover that I could find. As I fled through the forest, the sound of smashing and crashing came from behind me. The huffing and puffing of the agitated bear accompanied it. I made it about fifty yards when I came up to a wide creek bed. In any other circumstances, I would have tried to find another way across, but this was life and death. I had no time to think. As I reached the edge of the creek, I drove forward with as much power as I could, and I landed just shy of the other edge. I pawed frantically at the earth as I managed to pull myself up, and the second my feet hit the ground, I was running. At some point soon after, I realized the noises behind me had stopped. I looked over my shoulder as I ran and saw that the bear was gone. And only then did I dare to stop to catch my breath. To this day, I can only assume that the bear didn't like his chances of making it across and just stopped at the creek. A wave of relief washed over me, but it wouldn't last long. I soon realized that I had a new problem. I had no clue where I was. I suppose if I walked back the way I had came from, I may be able to find my way back, but that wasn't an option. What was it going to do? Well, as it turned out, not much. I did try to find a way out, but I gave up after an hour. Fortunately, I did have some emergency supplies with me, and dark was coming up only fast. I found a nice flat open spot and started a fire. I ate the last energy bar in my pack and crawled up alongside the fire in hopes that I could get some sleep. Falling asleep wasn't a problem, but I was awakened a few hours later when the fire burned down. I'd set a large log aside for such an event and pulled it onto the fire, and soon enough, the fire was roaring again and kept me warm until I woke up at around 8am the next morning. The fire was put out and I began walking the same way that I had been the following night, and since I was a national park, I'd assumed that I'd eventually come across some sign of civilization eventually. A few hours into my adventure, I heard someone yelling off in the distance. I'd been following it for about 10 minutes when I ran into another surprise. Luckily, this time it wasn't a bear. It was a member of the search team charged with finding me. I thanked him for helping me and gave him a big long hug. As it turned out, I had been walking in a circle all day. This is a common occurrence I'm told, but it didn't stop me from feeling stupid. I had, however, done one wise thing. By checking in with the rangers and giving them an idea of my plans, they began a search immediately. It may have been the only thing that really saved my life. I recommend everybody do the same. Even if there's no one where you plan to visit, you can at least leave instructions with someone back at home in case you don't return when you're expected to. It really only takes a moment. I learned a lot from those few frantic days. I become so fixated on all the lives lost around me that I've forgotten about the most important life, my own. And in hindsight, I guess the trip was just what I needed. I can't say almost being mauled by a grizzly was the ideal way to solve my problems, but we can't always choose the way in which we learn. I hope everyone is doing well now, and by all means, get outside and experience this amazing world in which we live in. Life goes by fast, and for many, ends far too soon. Enjoy it while you can. I met Holly at a party in 2010 when a mutual friend introduced us. I certainly was attracted to her, but I had a hard time believing a girl so beautiful could have anything in common with me. That was until she mentioned that she was into trail riding. Now she had my full attention. I'd been racing mountain bikes since my teens and I took it very seriously, so much so that my friends and me built our own cross-country course by hand one summer. I'd never met a girl this hot who was into anything that I was, let alone my favorite hobby. In retrospect, I assume this is why our friend got us together. We sat down in a quiet area of the house and talked until the sun came up. Then we went out to breakfast, just the two of us, and continued to getting to know each other. It was a surreal experience and I feared the minute that it ended that I'd wake up alone in my dinky apartment. Saying bye that morning may have been the hardest thing that I'd ever done. We'd made plans to go riding together the next weekend, but I had strong doubts that it would ever happen. The next Saturday, I was in Target buying some things when I got a text from Holly. Being my unconfident self, I thought my friends were just playing a joke on me. I'd mentioned how amazing she was to a few of them. Sometimes young males can be cruel with each other, and I assumed this was one of those times. She assured me that it was really her, 
but even as I drove out to the mountains, I was kind of doubtful. When I pulled into the parking lot, I caught sight of her amazing form and my stomach started to drop. This would be the ultimate test for us both. I would see if she was everything I'd created in my head and she would find out if I was really worth her time. From the moment we hit the trail, it was a constant competition. Neither of us were willing to give an inch and although I was able to maintain the lead, she gave me a real run for my money. By the end of that day, we had both passed with flying colors in my eyes. Now for brevity's sake, I'll just gloss over the next few years. In a sentence, our relationship grew into an all-encompassing love and we began planning our wedding after our graduation. We'd met our second year at university, so we weren't in any hurry to take that final step. To us, if we were truly meant to be together for the long haul, waiting until we completed school wouldn't make any difference. For my part, I wasn't sure that we'd make it all the way, but that was my insecurity talking more than anything. When the wedding day arrived, a small shred of fear still lingered in my mind. I don't remember taking a breath until we were in the car and on the way to the airport, and from the airport, we were off to enjoy a honeymoon in Colorado. Naturally, much of it would be spent riding the backcountry. It would be an unforgettable trip for us both, literally. Our first few days were spent seeing the sights and visiting friends in the area. It wasn't until our fourth day there that we set foot on any trails. There were no plans for any crazy racing or the like. That could be for future trips. We just wanted to get a feel for the area and enjoy nature. Our camp was about three miles from the park. We informed the office of our plans that morning and made for the trails. The sun had just rose and the day was forecasted to be a warm one. Ours would be a leisurely ride through the mountains in which we'd stop for lunch and return to the camp by dark. Holly had packed us a nice meal and a bunch of small snacks to keep our energy stores full. We had a wonderful morning just leisurely riding down the trail, but as we headed to the spot we planned to stop for lunch at, our competitive nature took over. Holly looked back and smiled before tearing off down the trail. I pursued her with all I had. She was about 20 yards ahead of me as we turned the corner, and I caught up just in time to see her lose traction on some loose gravel and tumble down the path below. I raced to the spot where she'd landed and when I got there, she was conscious but in a lot of pain. To my horror, I could see a small bit of her shin bone jutting from the skin. I don't think she realized it because she tried to put weight on it. I stopped her before she could do any more damage, and she quickly laid back down and complained of pain in her back. Now I had a reason to believe that she possibly had a spinal injury too. I knew I wasn't supposed to move her. Instead, I covered her with my fleece and told her to stay still. I pulled my phone from my pack and dialed 911, but the call wouldn't go through. I looked at the phone and saw that it only had half of a bar. I was beginning to panic a bit inside, but kept it to myself. I was posed with a hard choice now. Did I get on my bike and ride off in search of a better signal? Or did I stay with Holly and hope someone came along? While I pondered this, the adrenaline must have begun to wearing off. Holly was in severe pain now. I couldn't sit around and watch her suffer and the decision was made for me. I sat down next to Holly and told her about her situation. She was clearly scared, both of us were actually, but she knew it was something I had to do. She told me to go. As I left, I gave her a kiss and told her I loved her. Just in case, you know. I hopped on my bike and rode as fast as my legs could carry me. A mile or so into my ride, I rove at a large opening in the trees, and now my phone showed two full bars. I dialed 911, and this time it connected. I gave the operator as much information as I could. All the while, an overpowering feeling told me to get back to Holly as fast as possible. We spoke another minute, and the operator assured me that the search and rescue were on their way. I thanked her and disconnected the call and with a new feeling of hope, I hurried back up the mountain to Holly. She was really happy to hear the news, and as we waited for rescue, I did whatever I could to think of keeping her mind off the pain. I tried making jokes at first, but the pain was made even worse when she laughed. I switched things up and talked about her future after this was over. It was only about half an hour when I heard the thudding sound of a helicopter approaching and stop above us. They hovered there for a few moments until a group of men walked up the trail to our location. From then on, everything went like clockwork. They had Holly on a backboard and en route to the hospital in a matter of minutes. We'd spent two nights at the hospital, 
The staff were very professional, as were all of Holly's doctors. They commended me for not moving her or letting her fall unconscious, as it turns out that she also had a minor concussion that neither of us knew about. So I can't take credit for that one. Holly's leg would heal within a few months, and her back injury, which consisted of a few broken vertebrae, would take two surgeries to fix completely. She underwent extensive rehab after both and returned to riding soon after. The doctors considered her to be fully recovered and she assured me that she is, but I can tell the pain still comes back now and then. The accident did derail the rest of our plans at the time, but we returned to Colorado two years later to complete the honeymoon. In a move very out of ordinary for us, we didn't ride a single bike the whole time. It was a bit strange at first, but we quickly took to it. I'll admit it is easier to enjoy the scenery when you're not blazing through it. As far as riding and racing, neither of us do it as much as we used to. Having kids has put that on the back burner for a bit, but we have agreed that it will be something that we introduce to them as soon as they're old enough. It can be a bit dangerous to life and limb now and then, but that's often what makes life worth living, isn't it? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, and I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click the big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts, and there's new episodes every Tuesday at noon. Links in the description below, friends. Thanks so much, and remember, that one time, at Bandcamp. <laughs>